I used to work at Tesla, but now I work at a tech startup and it's very different. So if I were to sum up my experience working there, here's what I'd say. The office isn't just a place with free snacks and game rooms. These things are cool, but after like the first month, you don't really care about that. Now, every tech startup is different, but I think it's fair to say we work hard and play hard. I say this because you can find yourself putting a few extra hours on the weekend to get a project done by a specific deadline, but you can also find yourself skateboarding with a few coworkers on a random Thursday afternoon. So working at a startup is definitely a unique experience. To me, it doesn't really feel like I'm doing a job. It feels more like you're working on a school project with a few friends, but you're getting paid. Mainly because the casual atmosphere, the work from home flexibility, and most importantly, project ownership. When you're given a project, you fully own it. There is no one tracking your hours or micromanaging your every move. So that makes you feel like you belong to something special and your work has meaning. To make sure we're on the same page, I define a startup as a company that is in its early stages of development, self-funded or funded by investors, has one to three founders, has less than 100 employees, and has found a problem and is working towards a unique solution. The startup I work for is called Serve Robotics, and I work there as a mechanical design engineer. We make self-driving robots that deliver food. For example, if you're hungry and you want to order food from Uber Eats or DoorDash, instead of having a human go to a restaurant, pick up your food and then drive over to your house and bring it to you, a self-driving robot will do that job instead, which can be cheaper and better for the environment. Without getting into too much detail, the robot moves on sidewalks. It has a LiDAR and a bunch of sensors that allows it to see the world. It also has a little touch screen to be able to communicate with you. It's all electric and can carry up to 50 pounds. Now that you know what my company does, what do I do exactly as a mechanical design engineer? Well, as the name suggests, I work on the mechanical design of several parts on the robot. That includes things like the bin, the tail light, the drivetrain, or even how all these different sensors will be mounted to the robot. Now, what exactly does a mechanical design engineer do to create these parts? To answer that, let me explain the general mechanical design engineering process that we use at work. This isn't a process that's specific to my startup, as many mechanical engineers at a bunch of companies tend to do this. To design and build this robot, we break down the product, or as we call it in engineering, the assembly, into several smaller sub-assemblies. All these sub-assemblies come together to form a larger overall assembly that we call the Top Level Assembly, or TLA for short. Now, each sub-assemblies can contain even smaller sub-assemblies, but eventually these sub-assemblies get broken down into individual parts. For example, the taillight sub-assembly will contain parts like this metal grill, red plastic, etc. Usually depending on how big the mechanical engineering team is or how complicated the product that they're working on is, each mechanical engineer will usually own one to two sub-assemblies and all the parts within it. Moving on, every part or sub-assembly has a purpose that helps solve a problem. For example, let's say we need a spot on the robot to place and mount the batteries. To solve this, we start off with design requirements that define the part. Examples of design requirements include ability to hold up to 10 pounds, must be smaller than 10 square inches, prevents the batteries from overheating, etc. Once that's established, we'll need to figure out what kind of material this part will be made of, what manufacturing process we'll use to actually build the part, and how this part will fit with all the surrounding parts. As we figure these things out, we're usually working back and forth with the UX design team because they're in charge of making sure that everything we work on looks good to the final customer. Anyways, to complete the mechanical design process, we usually go through a product development cycle that contains eight steps. Conceptual design, design analysis, prototyping, production drawings, material science, pilot production, production, and QA. We use CAD software like SolidWorks to do the design analysis, prototype production, and production drawings. For example, we'll use SolidWorks simulation to do some finite element analysis to see how our design will perform under heat or heavy loads. We can then continue testing our design by 3D printing prototypes. Once we like our design and validate that it fulfills all the requirements, we'll get into production drawings. These drawings look like this and would get sent out to external suppliers who will give us feedback on how easy it is to actually build. The next three steps fall under the Computer Aided Manufacturing category, or CAM for short, where we convert CAD models into information that can be used by machines on the shop floor in order to transform raw materials into finished products. When you're going into the production stage of a startup, you're now out here making millions of products. Usually it's a few hundred, maybe a few thousand if your company has the money for it, has a clear mission, and is doing well enough to be able to afford it. Anyways, because startups are making millions of parts like Apple, for example, they can skip certain aspects of the production stage and they'll still be able to create a great product. 
Remember how I mentioned earlier that during the design stage or CAD stage of our product development process, we usually work really closely with the UX design team? Well, during our manufacturing or production stages, we work really, really closely with our supply chain and manufacturing engineers. Together, we create massive bombs. No, not that kind of bombs. This kind of bomb. It stands for Bill of Materials and is a list of all the raw materials, subassemblies, parts, and the quantities of each needed to build the end product. So the mechanical design engineers decided on what parts we want to use. Now the supply chain team will order these parts in large quantities and will be in charge of planning the production process. This process includes getting all our parts with all the different suppliers we work with, bringing all these parts together at a contract manufacturer or CM for short, where it's going to be assembled. However, if the startup is really, really small, then the mechanical engineers end up doing the supply chain work. That being said, let's talk about what the daily schedule looks like. I'd usually wake up around 8.30 a.m., take a shower and have some breakfast. Then I'm at my desk working from home, taking meetings in the morning. Usually my team and I have a daily stand-up in the morning where everyone talks about what work they did the day before and what they plan to do today. Usually I'm done meetings by noon. I then have some lunch and depending on the day, I'd either drive to the office or continue working from home that day. I go to the office if I need to do hands-on work like building a design, testing something I built, or if I have any work events or in-person meetings. However, if I'm just designing on my laptop or creating documentation, then I just do that from home. So I'm usually in the office about two or three days a week. One of the best things that came out of COVID-19 is a normalized working from home, which I'm grateful for. I personally really enjoy the hybrid work environment because I'm a pretty social person and I really like going to the office and talking to people and having real human interaction with the work that I do. The office also has a bunch of food that I'm snacking on while I'm working. But working from home in my own desk, in my own room is just amazing because I can get into this deep, focused work that I just can't when I'm at the office. Now my work day usually ends around 5 or 6 p.m. From then on, I'd usually go to jujitsu or hit the gym, depending on the day. Sometimes if I have a lot of work that I'm trying to get done, I may be doing a little work at night on my laptop around 9 or 10 p.m. I don't do this often, but only when I have tight deadlines coming up. Let's talk about some cool things that come from working at a startup. First, you can have the opportunity to work from home or at least have a hybrid work environment, which is a huge advantage for me because commuting can honestly be so tiring and just cooking lunch at your own kitchen is just, I don't know, it's really fun. Second, the atmosphere is so casual. You can walk in with hoodies and jeans or sweats and nobody cares. You don't need to be dressed formally or coming in a suit or something. The office is usually filled with snacks, which is nice. But not every startup is exactly the same because usually the startup office culture comes from the founder's personality. Third, schedule flexibility. There's no one tracking every single hour of your day. If you have a dentist appointment at 2 p.m., just go for it. You don't need to ask permission to do it. If a coworker has to pick up their kids from school at 3.30 p.m., they just go do it and then they come back to continue their work. So having this is really nice because you feel like you have control over your time. Finally, one of the coolest perks about tech startups is the level of project ownership that you have. You'll never be thrown with meaningless, mind-numbing work like grabbing coffee for someone. There is usually a lot of engineering work that needs to be done. So if they hire you, they're not going to waste you. They're going to try to give you as much engineering work as possible so that you're being beneficial to the team. Now, nothing is perfect and working for a startup can have its disadvantages. First, tech startups get their money from investors. They're not profitable yet, which means they have the potential to fail. And if that happens, you lose your job. But honestly, if you do your research before joining, like learning about the CEO, learning about the technologies that the company is using, you can avoid that. But low key, if you lose your job, you can just use the experience you gain to easily get another one. Second, you might make less money. See, if you work for a startup that's like less than 10 people, they probably won't be paying you a lot of money. You'll still get enough money to survive, but they'll be paying you a lot with shares and stocks. Now, for an early stage startup, these shares are worth absolutely nothing, but if the startup succeeds and blows up, then your shares will be worth a lot. However, if you work for a startup that's anywhere between 50 to 200 people, you'll be paid a lot better. But not as much as big tech companies though. To put things into perspective, a decent well-off tech startup can pay you upwards of $100,000 depending on your experience, whereas a big tech company like Apple or Facebook can pay you upwards of $150,000 on total compensation. These tech companies are insane. Now that we know the pros and cons of working at a startup, let's talk about the startup curve, which looks something like this. When you first join, you have so much enthusiasm. You're dealing with a new job, new people, a new product, so it's exciting and you sort of just wanna get your hands dirty and start working. But this can lead to the next stage of the startup curve, which is the grind. With this control and flexibility that you have, you among everyone else have the need to grow fast, you'll be working in a high pressure environment, and you'll be wanting to prove yourself. 
But if you're not careful, you can burn out. Moving on, in this environment, you'll have wins like releasing your design that you've been working on for the past few months to be built. And again, because you have so much control and ownership at such an early stage in your career, your wins here mean so much more to you than wins at a bigger company. But at the same time, any losses will hurt you just as much. Finally, we have scale. Now, many startups do fail. But the ones that begin to see some success will begin to scale and grow quite exponentially. As it scales, your startup will hire new people and new engineers, and you need to be comfortable letting these new hires take on the work that you were doing in the past. There will also be more structure and processes as the startup grows. You know, as you grow, you'll have a legit HR team and a proper recruiting team now, which is really rewarding to see and kind of exciting. But I just want you to remember this. Whether you're trying to work at a startup, you already work at one, or maybe you already work at a big company, chances are you're not curing life-threatening diseases. So no matter how crazy work gets, just relax and try to enjoy it. Anyways, I hope this video brought you value. If it did, check out this video where I share with you exactly what mechanical design engineers do, or check out that video where I share with you what my experience was like working as a Tesla engineer. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Peace!